I'm not the only one that feels this, but like, I'm sure. Does it feel like things are being shaken a little bit in our world? I mean, just a little, right? I mean, it's getting kind of, it seems kind of crazy, and I know maybe every generation says, it's just getting crazy, our generation is crazy. It seems like it's getting crazier, just my opinion. I, part of that is our 24-hour news cycle. I mean, people have always been a little bit crazy, I think, to a degree. Um, but I think, you know, news kind of uh, exaggerates that a little bit or amplifies it or whatever word you want to use there. But nonetheless, it does seem like our world is kind of undergoing a shaking right now. And it, it shouldn't be a surprise, but because, um, it's, again, it's been going on for a while. But when things are shaking... Do you ever ask yourself, like, is this God or is this the devil? Do you ever, things go on in your life, like, okay, is this God or the devil? Because sometimes when things shake, it's like, oh, no, it's got to be the devil. Or some people are like that, okay, everything's, you know, the devil's causing everything. Or it's the other way around, it's like God's causing everything. God's bringing judgment to the, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm not going to go there right now. It's another sermon. I could get off track on that. Um, I think the, when things are being shaken like they are now, is it God or the devil? The answer is yes. Yeah, both. I, I, there, there, it, uh, there is, a, and we're going to read this in a minute, God does shake things, but when God shakes things, it's to help us. Now, he doesn't... <laughs> Uh, I'm, this is going to be hard not to get off into a whole other sermon. God doesn't bring disease into your life to teach you a lesson. All right? Just, so that's that's bib, it's biblical that he does not do that. Because there's <laughs> disease that comes from the enemy, not from God. So there are a lot of things the enemy brings in that can cause a shaking. But God will use, will use that for good. And God does shake things, too, to himself without the devil shaking it. But when God shakes things, again, it's, it's to help us. When the devil shakes things, it's to harm us. And really the only way he can harm us is to cause fear or cause us to act on our fear. But he does that, and I think that's, I think that's going on a lot right now. I think it seems like God is shaking some things for our good. He's shaken things so much, a lot of idols have fallen in the last few months. I, I mean... Things that, I, that a lot of people enjoy that may have been, become idols. Sports, <laughs> for one. And I love sports. I love it. And like NFL, I'm like, it might not happen this. Like, are you kidding me? Football's not going to happen? <laughs> and if they're all kneeling on the sideline, do I want it to happen? Any? Oh, so that's an, oh, sorry. That's, that's an opinion there. But, but you know, it's like, was that an idol in my life? I don't think so, but... It was pretty hard not to be when my team are the Chiefs and they won the Super Bowl, just reminding y'all. Uh, but some idols have fallen. And, and those, are, those are good things. Families are spending more time together than they ever have. That's a good thing, mostly. My counseling load is a little higher than it has been in the past. <laughs> but other than that, we're good, right? Um, it seems like when God shakes things, the devil wants us to misinterpret the shaking. And I think that's going on now. This is just kind of my opinion. I can't prove it, but I, I feel, and just from what I see in the natural, it feels like, okay, God's doing some things. Of course, the enemy's doing some things, right? The enemy is the author of disease. God is not. He's the author of life. But God is shaking some things, but like the enemy's like, oh, no, here's what's happening. Oh, no, this is bad. This is really, really bad. This is, it's never been this bad, and it's only going to get worse. Like the enemy is there, and he's using his prophet, I think, the media, to really put that fear in us. Now, I, this is, I might really get in trouble for this sermon. I don't know, but I don't care. We'll just, we'll just get through it to the end. Just hang with me to the end. We'll get to God's word instead of my opinion, and then you can decide for yourselves. Um, it, 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 the enemy is trying to get the, the, the fear into us out of what maybe God might be doing. And I think that's something we need to, to be aware of because he wants us to misinterpret um, 
this whole shaking that's going on. Again, I think the devil is shaking some things himself, but uh, he wants us to misinterpret really what's going on, and I think that um, seems to be happening a lot. I was, oh, here was my disclaimer. This whole coronavirus thing, I, I, I'm not saying it's, cons- it's not a conspiracy. It's, it's, it's none of that. It's real. Uh, people are getting sick. Be, uh, 140,000 people in the U.S. have died for it. It's, it's a serious thing, all right? That's where I'm at. Let's treat it as serious and be careful. On the other hand, it's become, the, the enemy has dialed up the fear on that so much that it has paralyzed people. I'm going to talk more about that next week. Next week, I'm, if you think I'm fired up this week, next week, if, you, if you're faint of heart, don't come next week because I'm unloading next week. But anyway, um, <laughs> somebody like, oh, I'm really coming now. No. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't stream next week. Just, just wondering. Just you know, you never know who's going to see that. But, but it's 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 like there's this fear that yes, we need to be cautious and we need to be smart. But the enemy has dialed that up so high that it has created this fear that people are almost paralyzed. I'll talk more about that next week. But it's it's all part of this whole shaking thing, and. God does shake things, and I want to read that. So if you have your Bible and you want to turn to Hebrews 12 or your iPhone or whatever, punch up the app, or we're going to have it on the screen here too. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26. Um, As you're turning there, the the writer of Hebrews is talking about God shaking things. and Because God does shake things, and we read about it in Exodus. when, when When Moses was bringing the people... Uh, out of slavery in Egypt into the promised land and they were at Mount Sinai and God was there and, and the presence of God shook the whole mountain. It literally, physically shook. So there was a literal, physical shaking scared the daylights out of God's people. And so much so that they didn't want to approach the mountain. God was basically saying, come up here, my people, I want to be with you. I'll be your God, you be my people, we're good. <laughs> and because of that shaking, the, the Israelites were fearful, and I'm sure the enemy had a lot to do with that. So they're like, Moses, you know, how about you just go up there, see what he wants, and come back and tell us. We'll be good with that. That was not God's plan. But that's what man, men ended up doing, and so that's a whole other story. But um, So Hebrews chapter 12 Verse 26 refers to that. It says, when God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation, that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. Okay, just stop there for a second. So in Matthew 24, it's called the Olivet Discourse, that... Uh, the disciples are asking Jesus because he's talking about the end times. Like, I'm going to come back. And they're saying, okay, what's, tell us what it's going to be like when you come back. How will we know the signs of the times? And so in Matthew 24, he starts telling about things that will happen. He said there's going to be earthquakes. I mean, there's always been earthquakes, right? But there'll be more. There'll be famines. There's always been famines, but there'll be more. And I think part of that could be, is there more? Or because we have news, 24-hour news, like they didn't have 2,000 years ago, or 30 years ago, or maybe 20 years ago, like we hear about it so much. It seems like there's always an earthquake. There's always something going on. There's always a war. There's always a famine. It's like it's really increased. Now, has it increased, or do we just know more about it? All I know, it seems like it's increased. But whatever. And, he, and Jesus goes on. He says, the love of many will grow cold. Um, there'll be false prophets. And he's going on and on, telling like, it sounds kind of like us right now. And then he says this, he says, it's, it's the beginning of the birth pains. It's like, like <laughs> babies aren't just born. I almost just kind of, oh, this sounds kind of gross. I was going to say I almost fell out. I, did, I, was, my, I was born in the, del, in the uh, labor room because I was child number four. Sorry, mom, telling about your labor. But I'm, I was child number four. And uh, so when I came along, like the, my mom went to the doctor, like I'm, I'm having this baby. And the doctor, it was New Year's Eve. 
And he's like, uh, no, you're not having it. If you want to, if you feel, it makes you feel better to stay here tonight, stay here, but you're not having this baby anytime soon. So he goes off to his New Year's Eve party. I don't even know if he got to it. I don't know how far he got down the road. Boop, there I am. The nurse delivered me in the labor room because so, but still my mom knew, right? So there were still some birth pains. It just weren't very long. Now my wife, on the other hand, I'll let her tell her labor stories because that's what women like to do when they get together, right? Who had the worst labor? Me. Um, but seriously, 36 hours. It, and, and I can't complain about it because she'll tell, oh, you weren't, you weren't the one that, oh, it was so tough for me. I didn't get to go to McDonald's for 36 hours. But I was so hungry. Bang. Anyway. Uh, but birth pains are like, something's happening here. Uh Something's happening, right? So the baby's not coming right away, but we know something's going on. And that's kind of what Jesus is saying. It's like, when you see these things sort of amping up, it's not the time yet, but it's getting, it's really close. He says, you feel the birth pains, right? So this writer of Hebrews says, God's going to shake things again. He is, because he, well, they're quoting God from, from Haggai, actually, in the Old Testament, and so he's going to shake things again so much that eventually it's going to be whole new heavens and whole new earth, right? That's in, in Peter. It's in the Bible, Revelation. We read all about that, okay? That's ultimately where we're going, but that's, it's a process. And, and as that process happens, things are going to get a little weird. Well, they're already there. But, I mean, they're going to shake. But here's verse 28. Since we are receiving a, king, a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping, worshiping him with holy fear and awe. There's the good news right there. Are things shaking now? Seems like it. Are things, is God going to shake things? Yes. Do we have to be shaken? No. And that's actually the main point. And we're going to launch from there. So here's the main point this morning is this. The world's going to shake but we're not to be shaken. Just because things are shaking doesn't, need, doesn't mean that we need to be shaken. In fact, we should not be shaken. I had, a, I guess you would call it a, a vision um, several years ago. I don't know if it was six or seven years ago. Um, I wasn't looking for a vision. I just was in a kind of a prayer time, and I think um, my I think my eyes were closed and just kind of hanging out with God, and and all of a sudden I saw like this, I don't know, tornado, hurricane, and stuff was swirling all around me. I saw lawn chairs and like a barbecue, you know, going all around me. But there was, but I was in the middle, like in the eye of the storm, and it w- it was calm. But I looked out there, and it's like, man, don't go out there. <laughs> I think what God was. Um, telling me then, what, and he wanted me to share with the church, which I did at that time, is that as long as we were with God, like we're in the middle, we're okay. As soon as you start venturing out, you're going to get whapped by a lawn chair in the whirlwind. And so that's kind of where it's at now. I mean, that was more like a whirlwind than a shaking, but it's the same sort of thing as when we, when we live in the kingdom, when we understand the kingdom, when we operate as kingdom people, we're going to be okay. We're not shaken. It's when we like start acting like the world, living in the world, that's where we're gonna, when we're going to be shaken up a little bit. So I want to give you just three life application points here on this idea of the world's going to shake, but we're not to be shaken. So how do we, how do we live as God's people? Um, here's number one. Live in God's love, not man's fear. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. That's the biggest reason right here why there's so much fear in the world today. Because most people in the world do not have a revelation of God's love for them. Even a lot of Christians, like a lot of Christians. When I say revelation, they, Christians know in their brain, they know the fact that God loves them. God the Father loves them. If you just ask them, does God love you? Of course, yeah, God loves me. But if they were to speak 
from their heart? Do you feel in your heart that the Father loves you? It's like, mm, I don't really feel it. I know it, though. But do you, do you know it in your knower? Do you feel it? A lot of people are like, I've done a lot of, I've done a lot of bad things. See, they come up with all the excuses why they don't feel the Father's love. So this is not just a non-Christian thing. Christians and non-Christians can get caught up in fear because they, they don't have a, a really good revelation in their heart of the Father's love for them. And that's what the Bible says. If, if you know how much the Father loves you, you're not going to live in fear because you know he's, he's got you. He's the perfect Father. He's not just a good Father. I mean, we sing that, right? He's a good, good Father, and he, he's good, but he, he's, a, he's a little bit better than good. He's, like, actually perfect. And a perfect Father is going to take care of you. And I, I used to live in a lot of fear, a lot of different things, and it, even, even as a pastor, it took me some time to really get a revelation. I had to really ask the Holy Spirit to let me see that, you know, in the spiritual realm. Let me experience the Father's love so I could get rid of some fear. And it, it goes away. Now, I'm not saying we're, we do stupid things. I'm not saying it's, you know, we shouldn't be cautious. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this fear where we're scared of everything. You know what the... Uh, I keep trying to get into other sermons, but you know why the world is really scared right now? Because they're afraid to die. I mean, let's just face it. No, and, and nobody wants to die, I don't think. Most people do not want to die. Like my father-in-law always said, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to be the first one on the bus. Right? I get that. Um, we're all kind of like that. But like, at some point, we need to understand that the Father loves us so much, and, and when we're in Christ... And saved by him, when we just like going from this life to the next is like stepping out of one pair of shoes and into another pair of shoes. It's, and then that's where the Bible says that's where our life really begins. Right? I love this life. It's a gift, and I want to keep living it. But when, whenever it's time to go to the next, that's when we really start living. But most people don't know that, or they, don't, or they know it, but they don't know it. And that's why there's so much fear. If they understood the Father's love for them and accepted Christ as Savior, they, w- they wouldn't have the fear. That's what God's Word says. I mean, if I could just lay it out a little more bluntly, okay, hang with me. If you have fear in your life, it's because you don't get it. You don't get the Father's love. That's not a shameful finger point. It's like it's encouragement. It's cause, and, and I can do that because I've been there. I remember going through a season in my life where there was some things going on with some family members that really brought fear into my life, and the enemy just used that and leveraged it, and it just, it, it was a hard, hard, difficult time. And, it, and the Lord just had to do a work in me. Number one, it's like I had to, like, do you trust me? My head says, of course I trust you, but in my heart, I really had to trust him. And then, do you understand that I love you and I love them? And and as soon as I got all that here, like I was good. But it, it was a, a little process, a little bit of a process to get there. So we got to live in God's love. So this morning, um, I'm just, my encouragement is ask the Holy Spirit to really reveal the Father's love to you. Um, because that's how the Bible says how you get that. It's not me telling you that God loves you. That's why I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this point. I, you know that. You know here, but it takes the Holy Spirit to to really, the Bible says, actually pours it into your heart. So um, as we close this morning, and we're, we're not closing now, but when we do, uh, just ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the Father's love for you, for you in your heart, and that will drive out fear. So don't ask him to take away the fear. Ask him to fill you with his love and let you see his love, because then that will automatically expel the fear. Number two. Here's the big one. I'm, here's the biggie. Live your life according to kingdom principles. Again, there are a lot of Christians who are saved going to heaven who have fear because they're saved, but they still haven't got a full revelation of the Father's love. There's also a lot of Christians saved going to heaven who don't live by kingdom principles. Right? Let me explain that. 
Um, if we live and react like the world, even though we're saved, we're going to be subject to that shaking that we're talking about. But when we understand, wait, no, I'm a foreigner here. I'm really, I'm a citizen of heaven. We've taught on this a lot the last several years. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm seated in the heavenlies with Jesus because that's, I'm in him, he's in me, that's where he is. I'm good, we're, it's a kingdom. Got it. So let me read this. This is Jesus' words, Luke 6, starting in verse 47. Jesus says, As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on a rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. When you're built on the, on the, yes, on the foundation of Jesus Christ, but here it says, my teachings, right? He says, if you build on my what? My teachings, hear my words, you will not be shaken. When Jesus came, he said, I come preaching the what? Kingdom. He did not say, although... Salvation is in the kingdom. Jesus never said, I come preaching salvation. I come preaching a good philosophy. I come preaching stuff you need to know. That's all true. But what he said was, I come preaching the kingdom. That's what he preached. Now, salvation is in the kingdom, right? So that's part of it. So he, it, it's not wrong to say that he preached salvation. But he was preaching... a a bigger message than just not going to hell when you die. He was preaching the kingdom. And he's saying, if, if you build your life on what I've taught you about the kingdom, what I've showed you about the kingdom, what I've brought to this, this earth, if you live there, you're, you're not going to be shaken. People who don't build there are going to be shaken. So we need to build our life on those kingdom principles. So... What does that look like? <laughs> I want to share, this is so interesting to me. Um, go back when Jesus was just starting to preach the kingdom and people weren't quite getting it, but they were starting to get it. You know, most of you have probably heard this story of Jesus, feed, well, the Bible says Jesus feeding the 5,000. Probably not the best title, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Most of you know that story, but in case you don't, or to refresh your memory, I just want to read that quickly. And I've got two stories about the disciples that happened back to back. They happened like one in the afternoon, one that night. Okay, so here's the afternoon story. Matthew 14, starting in verse 15. So Jesus is he's preaching like to a bunch of people. They followed him because they've seen miracles. And, and there's like uh, 5,000 men, not including women and children, so there's 15,000 people, I don't know, a lot. And they're out in the middle of nowhere. Verse 15, that evening the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary, you feed them. Now stop there for a minute. Think about this. Jesus did not say, don't worry about it, I got it handled I'll take care of it. I will feed them. He did not say that. What did he say? You feed them. Uh, Jesus, we just told you we don't have any food. Well, we have two fish and five loaves of bread. But Jesus said, you feed them. All right, verse um, 17. But we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here, he said. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked, to, looked up towards heaven, blessed them. Then, breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to disciples, the bread to the disciples who distributed to the people. Stop there. Who distributed the bread to the people? Disciples. Where did the miracle take place? In whose hands? Disciples. Okay, let me just read. Keep reading. 
clean up the mess later. Um, verse 20. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day in addition to all the women and children. Okay, let, this will come more clear in a minute. So that happened, so they fed them, it gets dark, Jesus starts walking away, the guys get in their boat, and so now we're going to pick up the story, and I'm going to mark for this uh, version of it. Mark chapter 6, verse 47. So this is the same night, okay? Same day. Late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves. So the, the sea got really rough, and they were scared. About 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. He intended to go past them, but when he saw... Uh, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him, but Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I'm here. Then he climbed into the boat. The wind stopped. They were totally amazed. Here's the, here's the verse right here, verse 52. For they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. It's like they didn't get what happened a few hours earlier. Okay, so do you remember when Jesus, the other time he got into the boat when it was stormy? Or no, he was, he was already in the boat. He's down sleeping. And he's sleeping. He's in peace. And the waves are, it's like bad. And the disciples wake him up. Jesus, we're going to die. And he's like, you of little faith. Remember him saying that? So he said, you of little faith. Why would he say that? Why didn't he say, dun, 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 thank you for waking me up. Watch this. Peace be still. Now, he did reach out his hand and say, peace be still, but it wasn't like, dun, dun, dun. It was like, you guys, where's your faith? It's like God has given us power and authority on this earth, and it's not a genie in a bottle, but when, when the enemy is trying to throw stuff at us, we can... In the name of Jesus, reach out our hand and say, peace be still. And if it's the enemy shaking things and throwing things at us, he has to obey that. We don't get that. We don't get the power that we have through Jesus Christ. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I, we're not God. We're not Jesus. We can't do whatever we want. We're, we're not sorcerers, right? We don't do that. But when, when we come against the work of the enemy, the shaking of the enemy, the fear of the enemy, we have not only the right, but we have the power and the authority to say, stop right there. That is enough is enough. In the name of Jesus, stop. See, they, they, in the storm, they could have done that. They could have gone up and said to the storm, peace be still. But Jesus, like, but what the Bible says, they didn't do that because they didn't get the loaves and fishes. What did, what did they not get about the loaves and fishes? They didn't get that the miracle happened in their hands. Hello? Is anybody there? Or do you think I'm just whack? Because you guys are all like, Huh? Are you just tired or think I'm wrong or like you're just thinking things through because you're kind of scaring me a little bit. But you get this? Again, it was the power of God. It's the supernatural power of Jesus at work. Okay? Through people. That's Matthew 10, 7 and 8. Jesus says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, freely you give, uh, receive, freely you give. Right? <laughs> How can we do that on our own? We can't. It's the power of Christ working through us, but it's still us. That's why, it's, you understand why I say it's us. God's looking for willing vessels for the power of heaven to flow from heaven to earth. It's in the Lord's prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I've preached this a lot. We're like conduits. We're pipelines from heaven to earth. And God's looking for people, a pipeline that's clear of junk, that's not all mucked up with the sin of the world, and, and the faith is the valve that turns that on. I, I realize I'm getting into a, like a, a lot of different sermons here, but, and I preach this a lot too, 
God's power does not flow from heaven to earth because of need. It flows because of faith. I'm going to keep preaching that because it's true, and I didn't get that even as a pastor for years and years and years. Because what I heard, and when I heard that teaching, like God's power doesn't flow uh, because of need, it flows because of faith. I'm like, oh, heresy. And then it's like, but, but what man, what's man's greatest need? Salvation. Are you saved because you need to be saved? No. Otherwise, everybody would be saved. You're saved because of your faith. That's what the Bible says, right? You're saved because of faith, not because of need. Because the Bible says God is willing that none should perish. But people are perishing. Why? Because they've not put their faith in Jesus. So faith is what brings salvation. Faith is what brings healing. Remember Jesus, he'd heal people. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. It's faith. I even teach in Freedom Weekend that it's, it's by faith we forgive people. So everything that's good in the Christian life comes through faith. People who are filled with faith that know, king, they know kingdom principles. They know what life in the kingdom is about. They know the power and authority we've been given through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we're, God's looking for people who will go out in a storm and say, in the name of Jesus, peace be still. That's what he's looking for. And when we don't do it, and they, we go, God, come, Jesus, come here, we need you. He's like, you do it. I mean, he's not as mean as I am. But, but isn't that what he kind of told the disciples here? Where, like, they need some food. They're like, well, you feed them. Hello? We don't have any food. Okay, well. And, and so he lets, it's, it's, <laughs> It would have been a different thing if Jesus would have been like filling up baskets. Here, you get this basket. I mean, he's just handing out baskets. He didn't do that. According to the Bible, what he did is he broke the loaves that were there, gave them to the disciples, and as they handed it out, it multiplied in their hands. Do you get that? Because you've got to get that because that's a huge point that I did not see for years and years and years. And then you see this stuff and it's like, oh, that's where we've been missing it. We did not understand the significance of the loaves and the fishes. Are you with me now? Okay, so if we're going to be kingdom people, we have to understand the significance of the loaves and fishes. And that's what Jesus was trying to teach them because he was leaving pretty soon and he needed them to understand the kingdom because pretty soon they're going to be not only preaching the kingdom, they're going to be demonstrating the kingdom. Which, by the way, we're called to demonstrate the kingdom, not just teach it. But it says that <laughs> they didn't... They didn't get the significance of the loaves and fishes out on the sea there because they were, their hearts were too hard to take it in. I'm like, what? And so I, I, I did a word study on the, on the word hard in the original language of the New Testament, which is Greek, and it really means um, more, it means more like blind, right? It could be calloused, but, but life tends to callous your heart, right? When you go through hard things in life and shaking after shaking, I mean, I feel like, even now, i got to keep praying for my heart to stay soft because I, I just get, I'm getting hard. Like, I watch the news and I see people, do, like, I just, like, and i, I got to pray, God, I feel like I'm getting a calloused heart. Don't let me do that. But, so that, if that can be a part of that, why we don't live with kingdom principles because, like, I'm not going to help stupid people. Let them die. <laughs> we don't say that, but sometimes we feel like that. But it's more like we're blind, like we just don't understand. Remember when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, who was the Pharisee, he comes to Jesus at night, and Jesus says, um, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. He says that. Now, a lot of people think, and for years I thought, that that meant you're not, you're not going to go to heaven which it does, it, it does mean that. If you're not born again, you're not going to heaven, right? But it means more than that. If you're not born again, it's like you can't see the kingdom. You can't see what God's up to. You can't, you can't understand it. So that, that's another thing. As we step out with kingdom principles, the world's going to go, you guys are idiots. Like, you, you should be fearful. <laughs> it's like people... I've run across people who are offended that I'm not fearful. 
because I refuse to live in fear. I am not saying coronavirus is a hoax. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that um, black lives don't matter. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying any of that stuff. What I'm saying is I'm just not going to live in fear. I'm going to preach the kingdom. I'm going to live with kingdom principles. And people are like, you're an idiot. You better be scared. You better be scared out of your wits. Like, I am not going to do that. Again, I'm not, again, I'm not going on saying, well, you're, you're falling for a hoax and you're, it's a conspiracy and whatever. If there is, it'll, it'll get uncovered. That's not my deal. I don't uncover conspiracies. I teach the truth. And conspiracies will get uncovered on their own if I preach the truth, right? Okay. Can't preach till my pulse goes back down. No, teasing. We, there so, you can be saved. You can be saved and not see the kingdom, which means you don't understand it, okay? It doesn't mean you're not going to heaven, all right? And, and so we got, we got a, a boatload of Christians who are saved, put their trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, are going to heaven, but they don't understand the kingdom. Now, we, we could expect unsafe people to not understand the kingdom because Jesus says if, unless you're saved, you can't understand it. But if you are saved, you can understand it, and not only can you, you should. You should understand the kingdom because it's how we live. It's what makes a difference in this world. It's what he's trying to show the disciples by having the, the loaves and fishes multiply in their hands. It's why he said, you feed them. <laughs> it's why he said, you've little faith. Peace be still. So, in order to be not shaken, you need to understand the significance of the loaves and fishes. Hope you do. Because um, they're not limited, strictly limited to the laws of nature. That's another thing people have a hard time with. Well, so you think you're God? No, I just think he works through me. That's all. I'm seeing some crazy things happen. I mean, good crazy. Number three, shine God's glory in the darkness. There are people who, who read Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, and if you, take it out of, if you just take it out of context, or you just read that without reading the rest of what's going on, which is dangerous when you do that in the Bible. If you just read that, it's like, the world's going to go to hell in a handbasket. It's going to get bad. Really bad. We better buy guns and food. It's okay if you have guns and food. I don't have much for guns. Believe me, I got food. I'll be okay. If you want to come rob me, come, because I'm not going to shoot you. I'm not worried about that because I'm not living in fear. Now I just got off track. Where was I? So people, uh, Christians, a lot of Christians, not all of them, get into this, let's just survive in the natural. Let's get our guns. Let's store up food. And let's hunker down. Let's build a bunker. And let's just grind it out until Jesus comes back. And if anybody comes to try to steal my food, I'm shooting them. I'm making it kind of fun, but protect yourself, right? Have some food on hand. That's a good thing. But we get this idea like we're just going to grind it out until Jesus comes. And we're going to protect ourselves until Jesus comes. And it's going to get really bad. And nothing's going to be good. It's all going to be the worse it gets, the closer it is in coming. Ugh. But here's what the Bible says. And that's why we've got to tell the whole story, right? You can't just leave it there. Isaiah 60. This is talking about a time yet to come. All right? I think we're in that time. Or we're getting darn close. So this is a prophecy for the end times from the prophet Isaiah. So it's God speaking to the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth. And thick darkness is over the peoples. Is that happening right now? 
Is there a thick darkness over the peoples? Yes. But there's not a period there. There's a comma. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. And I know he's talking specifically, literally, to the the nation of Israel, but we're grafted into that, right? And so, by extension, you're a seed of Abraham. He's talking to you that, yes, there's going to be darkness on the earth. It's going to cover the earth, and people are going to be covered in deep darkness. But not you, because you're to arise. Does not say, go to your basement, load up your gun, get your food ready, and shoot anybody that comes towards you. No, you arise, shine, live like a person with kingdom principles. Like knowing that your father's going to take care of you, knowing knowing the significance of the loaves and fishes. That's what we're supposed to do. And when that happens, people will be attracted to that. Are you okay with, with weirdos being attracted to you? That sounded kind of, that didn't sound right. <laughs> but it's right, you know what I'm saying? Are, are you willing for people who you think don't get it at all, who are like so polar opposite of your views? Are you okay if they're attracted to what's going on in your life? That's the way it's supposed to be. We're not going to out-argue them. We're not going to out-shout them. We're not going to out-shoot them. We're not going to do any of that. We're going to out-shine them. It's going to be our life. People are like, why aren't you fearful? And now they're mad, but pretty soon they're going to like, okay, there's something. But when, we have, when we're people of peace and hope, and joy, there are going to be people that are going to be attracted to that. It's entire nations, like kings of nations are going to be like, no, there's something there. There's something there. We better learn from that. That's our role, is to arise and shine. Let the Lord, it's, it's not our light shining, it's the glory of the Lord shining through us as we live on kingdom principles. Can I quit now? Okay. Let me read this to you one more time. Hebrews 12, 28. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. So what are we supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to live in God's love, not a man's fear. We're supposed to live with kingdom principles. We're supposed to let God's glory shine through us, in us and through us, in a dark world. Because you know, when the darker it gets, the brighter the light is. But since we're receiving a kingdom that's unshakable, let us be thankful. Worship Him. That's what we're going to keep doing. We will always we will always find a way to gather. I don't care what goes on. We will always find a way to gather to worship God and to, be, and to show him our praise and thanks. And we don't have to do that on Sunday. Obviously, we need to do that every day of the week. Don't let this shaking, this darkness, don't let it become a distraction. It's distracting a lot of people. Don't, don't let it distract you from living with kingdom principles. Don't let it drag you into a place of fear. Don't let it snuff out your light. Let your light shine. Arise. Let your light shine. Don't let this stuff steal your faith. Why don't you stand as we close this morning. I want to pray that for you. Then we want to close with a with a proclamation song this morning father god in the name of jesus by the power of the holy spirit first of all i ask you holy spirit to pour in the father's love into everyone here that you would give everyone here a revelation of your love 
that we would know it in our knower and not just in our brain. And that that revelation of your great love will drive out all fear, which is a work of the enemy. So we receive your love now, Father, through the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to stand firm. Help us not to be distracted. And Lord, today we worship you. We thank you for being a perfect father. We thank you for bringing the kingdom to us, Jesus, so that we could live in an unshakable kingdom. We thank you. We give you praise and worship in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.